Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. We bring together the latest research in linguistics, language acquisition, and biblical studies to better understand the biblical languages and ultimately the biblical text. As always, this episode is brought to you by Biblingo, the premier solution for learning, maintaining, and enjoying the biblical languages. Visit biblingo.org to learn more and start your 10-day free trial. I am Kevin Grosso, your host for this episode, and I'm excited to talk with Dr. William Varner today about the Legacy Standard Bible. Welcome to the show, Will. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for your work with Biblingo. I deeply appreciate it. Yep. And uh, so let me just introduce you to William Varner. Many people know who he is, um, but this is some of this information was a little bit new to me, so I'll, I will read this uh, bio that he has which is on Wikipedia that you can find. Um, So he is an American Bible scholar. He is professor of biblical studies in Greek at the Masters University. Varner studied at Bob Jones University, Dropsy College, Biblical Theological Seminary, Gratz College, and Temple University. He and his wife, Helen, have two grown children and one with the Lord, plus four beautiful grandchildren. He grew up in South Carolina in a non-Christian home and came to the Lord at age 17. He attended Bob Jones University and then graduated from the Biblical Theological Seminary in 1972. Will was a pastor in Pennsylvania for seven happy years and during that time earned another master's degree in New Testament and experienced his first trip to Israel, an experience that would leave an indelible mark on his ministry. He then served for 17 years with the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry in New Jersey while earning a third master's degree in Jewish studies at Dropsy College and then a doctorate at Temple University in Philadelphia. In 1996, he came to the Master's College, where he teaches Bible exposition courses and Greek exegesis. He was also the director of IBEX, the college's overseas campus in Israel, for over 20 years and has led 51 study trips to the land of Israel. Will pastored the Sojourners Fellowship in Grace Community Church for 23 years and now teaches the Bereans class at Grace Baptist Church. He has written 20 books, some for laymen and some for scholars. His most significant scholarly efforts have been the 450-page commentary, on James, published by Fontes Press, and a new translation and introduction to the Apostolic Fathers, published by T&T Clark. And for those of you that don't know, he is also, um, I think, the founder of the Nerdy Biblical Language Majors Group, which... Yes, uh, some some of my students actually founded it and asked me to be administrator, and I've stuck uh, stuck with it for all these years. Yes, and so if you don't know about the group, I don't know where you have been. Um, It is a very lively, very large group where posts are made really hourly, <laughs> at least with all kinds of things related to biblical languages. And I, I've ref- seen you referred on there as Papa Nerd. Is that a title that you normally go yeah, by? A quote, affectionate, unquote term for me, uh, Papa Nerd. <laughs> gotcha. Nerdy yeah. biblical language majors. It's a self-criticism uh, that the students made. They considered themselves nerds, so they called it that. <laughs> It spawned some other nerdy theology majors, nerdy geography majors. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's and I I personally had some some good discussions on there, which is which is pretty fun. So, but today we're talking about the LSB, the Legacy Standard Bible. So let's just start with what was your involvement in this project? Yes, I was involved to join a committee. And the primary translation committee was six. Three from uh, the Master's University, where I teach, and three from the Master's Seminary. The three primary translators, I was one of the three primary translators, and three were consultants. Uh, And Abner Chow and I were the primary translators of the New Testament. And then Abner Chow and uh, Joe Zakevich were the primary translators of the Old Testament, and I served as a consultant in that regard. So my biggest uh, responsibility was translating the New Testament along with Abner Chow, and then consulting uh, on their translation of the Old Testament. I also revised the subheadings, which were not translations, of course, but needed a, a, a revision. Um, yes, it is a revision of the New American Standard Bible, 1995, but we went off in our own way. It's not just a occasionally change a word for word in the NASB, uh, but uh, we took that as the base text, If the NASB was good, and that's what the Greek and Hebrew said, we didn't touch it. But uh, if we thought not so much an error, but 
it could be improved, we felt uh, the freedom to do that. That's what uh, the uh, Legacy Standard Bible is all about, to preserve the legacy of the New American Standard Bible uh, translation, but to recognize that it can be improved. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. So, I mean, I think one of the like really basic questions, you know, obviously that you have to answer for another English translation is why are you doing another English translation? <laughs> you know, so so can you explain a little bit how a little bit more deeply how is this different from the NASB 95? Like why why does that need an update at this point? Yeah. And that's a good translation. I can really understand. We have a plethora of English translations. Sometimes I feel a bit of a guilt when I talk to my brothers and sisters in Bible translation overseas, where there are languages that don't have a first uh, version in their language. And here we are with so many. I understand why people would say, why? Uh, and uh, I understand that it's not just to make money. I can tell you that right now, not at all. But uh, there will always be a need to take another look at our translations. I see work that I've done writing a book and years later I go back and say, I think I need to revise that a bit. There will always be a need to hone and sharpen our translation. So that's what we did. There were some changes in the NSB 20 that came out that we were not entirely comfortable with. So we felt like that also justified another look uh, at the base text of the New American Standard Bible uh, and uh, going at it uh, with uh, fresh eyes. So we can understand why people might say, oh, why another one? But uh, I do think uh, there's a justification uh, for having uh, another translation, the Legacy Standard Bible. Yeah, that's great. And so what does make the LSB different? You know, just from a why we would need another translation. What did you do differently? What are some distinctive features of the LSB? Yeah, I think the, the, the two that jump out at most people for is uh, our translation of yod Hey vav Hey, the Tetragrammaton, as Yahweh instead of the traditional approach to it, translating it by Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, to distinguish it from Adonai, where most translations have capital L, small O-R-D. We translate it as Yahweh. Are we absolutely 100% sure uh, that that was the way it was pronounced in Old Testament times? Well, maybe we're 99% sure, <laughs> but it is as close based on a number of scholars' uh, research in this area that it was pronounced Yahweh. Now, my uh, hearers or viewers may know this, they may not know this, because of the, the sacred association of the Tetragrammaton that you shall not take the name of the Lord or Yahweh your God in vain. There arose a tradition in ancient Judaism not to pronounce that word, at all, that name as all, at all, lest you pronounce it wrongly, and thus you would thus take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. So they didn't pronounce it. There was a Jewish tradition that it was only pronounced once a year when the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, would go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the tradition was standing there before the mercy seat, he would say the pronunciation. So, so it was not known. Uh, and uh, thus Jewish people don't usually pronounce it. That is Orthodox Jewish people. Uh, they will either say Hashem, the name, or, or use some other word than Yahweh. Uh, uh, so, so uh, it, it all goes back to that. But the work of scholars, Hebrew scholars, Semitic scholars, have come to the conclusion that it probably was pronounced Yahweh. Now, why is that important for us to do that? Well, you know, I, I think of the Aaronic benediction. Uh, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh show his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you face, uh, uh, peace. The ironic benediction said by the priests uh, uh, in blessing the people. Well, a verse right after that, it says, and so shall you put my name upon the people. 
So uh, my name is yod heh vav So we believe that that, because it says that, putting my name on the people, that it's important to know what God's name is. And so that's why we translate it as Yahweh. Uh, we left Lord as the translation of Adonai uh, in the Old Testament. But now you can see a distinction, uh, you know, even in Psalm 110. Uh, uh, Yahweh said to him, you are my son, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sit at my right hand. Yahweh said to Adonai, uh, which of course has implications for plurality in the Godhead. So, so there you can see the distinction. Now, many lay readers come to capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and small, and, and capital L, small ORD, and may not see that. The uh, translators meant to communicate four capitals is the divine name and uh, one capital L is Adonai. But many readers may look over that. And, and so we think that for, to grab their attention, for them to see this is the divine name. Uh, he says it is my name in Exodus 3. So we thought that it was uh, important. There's a bit of a shock value in reading it. Uh, uh, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. Some people say, well, I'm used to saying the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> we understand that. But maybe there's a value to the shock uh, effect of that. Oh, that is God's uh, personal name. Yahweh is my shepherd. So that's one of the things, uh, uh, the distinctives, the one that jumps out. Probably the other one, and it's not the most important to me, but it is important. Uh, doulos in the Greek New Testament, eved in the Old Testament, oftentimes, most of the time, I wouldn't say all the time, but most of the time, doulos means one person who is owned by someone else, not just as their paid servant, but as their slave. So in the New Testament, we translated doulos and douloi pretty uniform, well, uniformly as slave or slaves. So uh, again, People got used to it. Paul, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's making a point that I belong to God. I am his slave. So those are the most distinctive uh, ones, uh, Kevin. Uh, there's more, but maybe they are more subtle in, the, in their significance than those two biggies. Yeah, no, that's great. It's not innovative in, in the sense of, uh, you know, like no one else has done that before, right. but it definitely leans more towards um, really away from your translation philosophy. I mean, not necessarily your, tr your translation tradition, I should say, towards people who, um, you know, tend to be, again, th uh, these terms are all bad, but like what's called like more free translations, right? Would be much more willing to adopt Yahweh, but, mm -hmm. but you guys still, you know, stick very closely you would still fall in the category of literal translations. And in fact, in this case, it is like more literal to translate yod heh vav -Hey as Yahweh. It is. Um, but, but it is against the grain of the literal translations, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the tradition of many literal translations is just do it like it was done in the King James or are or, or close to it. Uh, but yeah, we are departing uh, from that, but you're right. It's an insight there. While we depart from some literal translations in that regard, it is more literal because we're distinguishing between Yahweh and Adonai by, edit this, okay, uh, by um, Yahweh and uh, Lord, okay? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, that's great. And we also, you know, talked a little bit about this offline. You also distinguish between Naos and Hieron. What are the differences between these two words? Um, and how have you represented these differences in, in English? So if, for those that don't know Greek, right, educate us on what these words sure. refer to. Happy to, and I'm glad you uh, raised that issue. I really like to talk not so much about Yahweh, not so much about slave. Let's get over to our idea of trying to be as consistent in rendering a Greek word the same way if possible throughout in this case, the New Testament. And you mentioned the case of Heros and Naos, or Heron and Naos. Uh, uh, oftentimes, translations, and I'm not just talking about the King James here, 
some more modern translations will just translate both of those Greek terms as temple. But we are convinced uh, that the general word uh, for temple, which includes the outer courtyards and the inner courtyards, but particularly the outer courtyards, is Iran. And so that is the temple. But there's an inner part of that temple. In the Old Testament, it was the uh, the uh, holy place and the holy of holies. In the New Testament, it's the place inside uh, the uh, beyond the uh, court of the women to the court of the priests, which was the sanctuary. Uh, and, and then, of course, the uh, holy place and the holy of holies was there. So where the priests hung out, uh, and there was a little fence, as a matter of fact, where lay people could come up to, that would be part of the temple. But on the other side of that fence would be the priest's area. And that is what we think would be distinguished as the naas, the sanctuary. And we tried our best to be consistent in that regard. And I think the New Testament is consistent as well. When uh, Zechariah went into the temple, he went into the Naas. He went into the sanctuary, not the Holy of Holies, but the holy place. And that's, of course, where the altar of incense was. And that's where he saw the uh, archangel. So, so uh, but when Jesus sold, uh, excuse me, condemned those who were selling things in the temple, it's not Naas, sanctuary. It's Heron because the outer precincts of this sacred place was the court of the Gentiles. And that's where they had set up their tables for selling wares. So when Jesus cleansed the temple, he cleansed the outer court, uh, the Heron, uh, but he did not cleanse the Naas because that's not where they were setting up their wares. Uh, one thing that this adds to that, you say, oh, well, what's the big deal? Well, when when Judas, quote, repentant uh, of sort and and, uh, and regretted what he did, not truly repentant, but regretted, it says he took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it into the Naas. Well, he had gone through the court of the Gentiles, through the court of the women, right up to that fence and threw that money over into the Naas, uh, much to the shock of the priests. So we think that's important to distinguish between the outer part, i.e. the temple, and the inner part, i.e. the sanctuary. Yeah, that's that's great. You know, I, I lived in Israel for five years, and that's something that when you're there, like it's it's very, um, like when you're standing on the Temple Mount, it's like, oh, yeah, these are different places, <laughs> right? So I just curious, I mean, how much how much does your experience, and I did not know that, you know, you've took, taken 51 trips to uh, to Israel. How much did your experience just being there, you know, kind of lead to this distinction in this translation? Well, yes, of course, uh, the uh, area today is a Muslim area, but the boundaries of it are still the boundaries of Herod's temple. Right. Uh, uh, the, this huge outer court or Iran you can walk around in uh, uh, today, uh, but then there's a there's a place where the it goes up just a little bit, and then up there is the Muslim uh, Dome of the Rock. That would have been the Iran. Uh, I'm sorry, the Naas, the sanctuary. I don't know if you were allowed to go into the Dome of the Rock when you were there, Kevin. But uh, I would say about the first thirty times that I went there, they allowed you to go into. Uh, the Dome of the Rock. And the last 21 times, uh, no, you can't do that if you're not Muslim. But we used to go in and see the rock, the rock on which Ark rested. Uh, one uh, scholar even thinks he's identified a groove in that rock where the Ark of the Covenant rested, because it's the same dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. That was the Naas. That was where only the priests and then where the ark was originally, not in the second temple, uh, was where the uh, the high priest went only on the uh, day of atonement. That's the sanctuary. So even though it's not the uh, Herodian structure, even though it's Muslim structures, 
it's the same place. And it, it does add, I think, and confirm uh, what I'm saying uh, about the outer court where the court of the Gentiles was and the inner court where the priests were. That's the Naas. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And and like you said, I mean, as you brought up, there are really all kinds of distinctions. You know, when Jesus is cleansing the temple, it really doesn't make sense for him to be cleansing the sanctuary, right, proper. You know, you wouldn't have had people selling, you know, you animals there. But temple complex is just so massive. And, oh. and you can totally see, you know, all kinds of activities taking place in those outer parts of the, yeah. of the complex. But so when people read just the temple, it's very hard for them to see, you know, okay, what, what's the distinction between, you know, being off the, like outside the actual sanctuary and in the temple. Right. But if you, when you're there, it's like, oh yeah. I mean, this, this place is just so big. There would be oh, yeah. room for all kinds of things. Right. I mean, it's just, I, I did not get the privilege of um going inside. I, I know of some people that, snuck in some in different ways um but i Maybe i was not put on a kafia and yeah, yeah. pretend that they're muslim <laughs> exactly yeah i know i there was one guy who had a um a muslim name i think from ethiopia and so he just you know showed showed him his passport with his name and walked right in you know uh but i uh, william and kevin wouldn't work on that right exactly exactly that's the that's the problem right and i don't look <laughs> the part either so <laughs> Uh, nor nor do you. So those are some of the distinctions and the you know uh, features of the LSB that are different. A, a lot of times, though, you are sticking, you know, pretty closely to the NASB. And so yeah. I I just went and checked, you know, different passages. I I have this list here that you know I we talked about John three three. You have born again rather than born from above. John twenty one phileis and agapas both equal love. Acts fifteen twenty are you know. Um, the four things that Gentiles aren't supposed to do and very like, you know, sort of standard literal translations of those pistis Christu, faith in Christ. You know, in, in the scholarly world, if you were to read a commentary on these things where a scholar is doing their own translation, they will often depart from the, you know, uh, kind of standard translation of these. So can you just walk us through, you know, kind of pick your pick your poison here on, on which passage um but just what what you guys were were thinking and and really the process of translating some of these more difficult and debated kinds of texts yes uh well acts fifteen twenty mentions among the four things that uh you are to stay away from uh you gentile believers one of them is pornea and there's a traditional translation some versions have it some don't of fornication. Now, fornication in English has a certain definition, uh, but we believe that uh, that was not just uh, asking uh, Gentile believers to abstain from premarital uh, sex, but uh, uh, like the word pornography comes from it, uh, any sort of wrong sexual encounter. So we translate it sexual uh, immorality. Uh, some translations stuck with uh, 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 fornication. We need to keep in mind that every version today is, in a sense, <laughs> a revision from the biggie back in 1611, the authorized version, the King James Version. So so while uh, oftentimes we're, uh, I'm going back and I'm saying, well, the King James had that, but we have this. Uh, so, so in a sense, uh, we're following in a tradition, but language has changed since 1611. Uh, 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 so fornication did not have the specific meaning that it has today uh, in English. So we need to adjust uh, for changes in language in that regard. So uh, that's one of the things. Uh, John 21, the influence of uh, 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 the synonyms of the New Testament uh, and the distinction between phileo and agapao there. Uh, are you fond of me? Uh, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, you, you know, uh, that that distinction, we just believe that that cannot be justified uh, by its use elsewhere in the Gospel of John, where 
Jesus says, my father agapaos me, loves me, and also my father phileos me. And uh, there's a wealth of times in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where phileo and agapao are even used in the same verse to mean the same uh, thing. So we did not buy into that. Where there's legitimate distinction between synonyms, we bring that out. Uh, and uh, 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 But when there's not clear distinctions, and John is known for using synonyms, we went with love, love there in uh, John uh, chapter 21. It is true, uh, and you know this, Kevin, that Anothen in John 3, it's used in the very same chapter, the one who comes Anothen from above where John the Baptist is referring to Jesus. Yes, even the Gospel of John will use anothen from, uh, as from above. The, uh, the veil of the temple was rent anothen, from above. So uh, some translations translate that, except a person be born from above. But, you know, this is a legacy. We're trying to maintain a tradition here as well. And the language of born again is so traditional. And it's not wrong. Being born from above is being born again. We stayed with the tradition there. But we were careful at a footnote saying born again or born from above. So that's how we handled it. Trying to maintain that tradition, but also in a footnote saying, yes, we respect the tradition. But this can also, in this case, be translated as born from above. So those are some of the uh, ways that we try to maintain a legacy, try to maintain our tradition. But when the Greek says, I want you to understand it this way, we went with that uh, that translation. So, yeah, that that's great. And, and can you walk us through um, a little bit about how the process like um behind getting to some of these conclusions so you said okay we want to we want to do born again for john 3 3 to keep with this tradition why why keep with with the tradition there and deviate with yahweh for example yeah, say, well, look, Yahweh well, is my answer, shepherd. that's a very very good question it is traditional uh to say capital l capital o capital r capital d for yahweh for the divine name should we respect that uh, tradition? Well, we respect those who do it, but it's too traditional <laughs> because cap L O R D and L O R D, whether they're capitalized or not, they are two different words: Yod Hey Vav Hey and Adonai. So we felt like uh, it, it, it's okay to depart from tradition there because these are two different Hebrew words. And we wanted the reader to see that and not maybe miss it if they miss that one is in all four caps and one is in one cap. So that's why we went with that. But these are questions that we wrestle with all the time, Kevin, R really. Uh, how to respect the tradition and how to introduce something. And did we get it all right? I, I don't know if we did, but we sure made a, an effort and there's deep discussions within our committee uh, on should we go uh, there or not. I had, and I don't mind advertising it because it's no longer published. I had the old Bible works on my computer and I'm constantly, as we're seeing the Greek, we're seeing the NASB, we're seeing all the versions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm constantly uh, you know, saying, well, you know, this version, this version, this version supports our idea. Uh, I, I'm constantly looking at the Septuagint in the Old Testament. Did the Greek translators understand our uh, translation of this Hebrew word? I'm constantly looking at uh, Jerome, uh, uh, that Jerome's Vulgate. How did he understand this translation? So, so we're trying to respect the tradition of the English translations, but constantly, uh, that's the process. Uh, and and uh, I was known particularly for, well, you know, Jerome here understood it this way. We at least need to be aware that Jerome understood it this way, whether we 
uh, adopt his uh, uh, understanding of the Latin there or not. So, you know, it's every day, every point is, is, is discussed like that. Did I win every argument? No, I didn't. But 98% of the time we agreed. <laughs> uh, there wasn't like fighting going on. But hey, listen, anybody who wrestles with the original languages knows that some of these issues are not just black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's there, there's issues uh, for discussion. And, and, and so uh, that's what we constantly did. Uh, uh, and, and no, we didn't do this. Uh, well, eight of our translations on my screen have it this way. Two have it this way. So the majority must rule. No, we made our own decisions, but we respected the other translations, even though, as you well know, Kevin, the philosophy of translations for some of these is wildly different uh, from, from a more literal to a more dynamic, a more formal equivalence to a more functional equivalence. Uh, so uh, I don't say think that we're in the middle of that spectrum. Every now and then I see something published about 20 versions and they're on a scale. Uh, uh, yes, we're probably more uh, on the literal side uh, and we never really said, well, eight to two wins, <laughs> we will go with the majority, but we had to be aware of what others were doing it, but also what the ancient translators were doing it. That's why we looked uh, not only at the Hebrew and the Greek, but we looked at uh, the Vulgate uh, and, and also at the Septuagint as well in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, that's great, and it, I'm I'm happy to hear that you you know were consulting you know some of the early church fathers and and that kind of thing because that it really is there's a wealth of information there Absolutely. that is often glossed over by Protestants you know because we're not supposed to view them as authoritative. But oh but, no, no, can't quote man, Jerome; he was a Catholic when and he wasn't. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, it, it, but it's 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 a shame really because there's so much to learn from that material. The fact that they really did live in a world that was so much closer to the you know the world of the apostles is something very valuable you know and it's just again it's something to learn from so we're really happy that you know you were pushing people in that direction i don't know you know if, if you were the only one but let me, I, let me... I think i was known for two things varner's always going to bring in uh, what the ancient versions have and varner's going to do the textual criticism <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we went with uh, probably the NA27 Greek uh, renderings. We also looked at the SBL uh, Greek New Testament. We also looked at the Tyndale House Greek New Testament. So we looked at the NA27, NA28, uh, the Tyndale House. Uh, so, so we did look at other uh, uh, texts, but we ended up more often than not agreeing with the uh, more modern uh, text criticism view of uh, that, that that's embodied in the Nestle Elan in the UBS text. If our readers, if our viewers don't know that, line, the Nestle Elan 27 and 28 and the United Bible Society fourth and fifth editions of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, and, and the important thing there is that it's it's really against the base text of the KJV that is, you know, sort of the, yeah, I mean, the traditional text in that sense. Yes. So you, you mentioned the translation philosophy of the LSB and kind of comparing it to other translations. Can you explain for us, I mean, you mentioned the word literal, dynamic equivalent, right? These kinds of things. Can you explain some of these terms and the philosophy of the LASB in general and how it compares to some of these other translations? Yeah, it was literal translation versus dynamic, literal equivalence versus dynamic equivalence. Uh, it's morphed over the years to two different terms. The literal is now viewed as more formal equivalence, and the dynamic equivalence is more functional equivalence. So formal equivalence is what is the formal one-for-one -one translation of this Greek word? Functional equivalence is, but what is the Greek word's function? What is its broader meaning? And we definitely landed on the formal equivalent uh, uh, philosophy of translation with other versions like the New American Standard uh, version would be more uh, formal equivalents. On the other end of the spectrum, and I'm going to go all the way to the other end on these, you have the New Living Translation and the, and the Message 
that would be far more functional equivalent. And it used to be we viewed the NIV as more functional equivalent, just the opposite of formal equivalence. But to be honest and, and fair to them, the NIV is more like in the middle, trying to achieve a balance between functional and formal equivalence, because you've got much more functional equivalent like the New Living Translation and, and, and the message, which sometimes really you can't even recognize the underlying Greek under their English. So, yes, we are with uh, the ESV, the NASB. Oftentimes people say, well, the KJV is literal. Oh, no, it's not literal. Uh, <laughs> when Paul says in Romans, God forbid, the word God is not in that expression. It's mm -hmm. meganoitai. It's, uh, it's may it not be. So, so uh, the King James was not always literal. Uh, so when we came to Meganoita, we did not translate it, God forbid, even though that might be a functional idea behind it. We translated it the way most modern translations do. May it not be. Uh, may it never be. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Meganoita. The King James said, God forbid. It literally says, May it not be. And that makes sense. It, it communicates. So, so uh, yes, we're more on the uh, uh, formal equivalent uh, of that span. Uh, but we think uh, it's safer. Uh, because once you start getting into functional equivalence, there's a lot of disagreement. Well, how does that functionally mean this? Maybe it functionally means that. So if we err, we err on the side, yeah, of safety. We err on the side, if if I want to say we're erring, of uh, uh, formal equivalence. That's that's the issues involved. Yeah. So can you tell me why would you, you know, lean that way on on the spectrum? I mean, what what, what do you view as the sorts of the issues involved with choosing a more formal equivalence kind of philosophy? And you versus a, a dynamic equivalence. I mean, what, what, yeah, what's the problem with God forbid? One of the reasons is that the whole trend is more towards uh, functional equivalent and we're fighting against that. No, uh, God forbid means that. If God forbids it, that's very strong. And the King James translator says, what kind of expression can we use to, to uh, I mean, this is a very strong, to use a long word, a severation. Absolutely not. Well, God forbids it. But uh, not that it's evil to do that, but let's see what the Greek says. The Greek says, may it never be. Uh, we say today, no way, man. <laughs> Somebody even told me that they saw a functional equivalent translation one time that said, no way, man. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it says, may it never be. Well, may it never be communicates. It, it communicates. So uh, we went to that. Uh, another functional equivalent is Adel Foy, uh, the masculine uh, uh, plural uh, for the word brother. Now, we know very much when Paul uh, and New Testament writers addressed the brothers in an assembly, he wasn't list, uh, 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 limiting it to the males in the assembly. We're fully aware of that. And so many uh, functional equivalent translations, and even the NASB 20 did this. When they got to Adelphoi, they said brothers and sisters. Is it wicked to do that? No. But the Greek does not say brothers and sisters. The Greek says Adelphoi. We're trying to translate the Greek. Let the reader have some common sense and understand that when he's addressing a congregation, uh, and addresses them as brothers, he means the, the the sisters as well. One of the things we like to point out is that when a Greek writer wanted definitely you to understand that he's talking about a brother and a sister is uh, James in James chapter two, when he says, if a brother or a sister, if a brother Adelphos, or if a sister Adelphe does this, so there, absolutely, we're going to put brother and sister. So, so those are some of the issues as to dynamic versus literal, as to formal versus functional. Uh, and uh, again, I say for the second time, if we erred, we erred on the side of conservative formal equivalency rather than functional equivalence. 
Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful just to get people an idea of, you know, where you are on that on that sort of spectrum. You made several posts about Scott McKnight's new translation. And most of the time you would post something he translated, right? And you might compare it to the ALSB or something. And and you normally didn't comment very much on it, but you would, you know, show people how he's translating, um, you know, different passages. So, and we we actually had him on the show previously to talk about his translation and 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 what he's trying to do. And we're trying to get a variety of of perspectives on the on these issues. So can you give us some of your thoughts on his translation and his translation philosophy? So we we compared, you know, you just talked about you know some of the differences between the LS LAS or LSB and the NASB, for example, or the NLT or the message, which all have philosophies that um you know we more or less can see. Um, but Scott's translation, if you just read it, it's like, oh wow, you are doing something different, right? I mean it's it's very obvious. Yeah. And he wants people to to have that same, you know, exact feeling of like, oh, wow, you are doing something different. I think Scott wants to use shock therapy. Uh, you, you know, he wants to shock us and, and to make us think, uh, you know, and I have great respect for Scott, great, uh, great respect for his, uh, uh, his his ministry and his love for the Lord and his scholarship. I would just post these, these uh, uh, comments without my comment much at all. And some of the people really tore into him. I, I know that. Uh, and I don't think we should tear into him. Scott is not trying to write a translation that is going to replace the NIV, is going to replace the New American Standard Bible. I think he wants it for private use. And for us to see, for those of us who may not know the Greek, uh, what is a very literal translation of this, even if it it shocks you. You're so used uh, to 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 hearing a, a, a high priest. He translated senior priest. Now nobody does that, but I think he's just doing it to make you think. If he's a senior priest, then there's other guys underneath him. Uh, should he have gone with high priest? Well, that's his business. He's really trying to get us to almost overly literal at times, almost crassly literal at times, to make us think that is how the original uh, readers must have seen this, senior priest. One guy says, when I think of senior, I think of older. The high priest wasn't always the oldest. Okay, all right, all right. But, you know, we hear high priest, high priest, high priest, high priest. We don't think about it senior priest? <laughs> well, there's a, a zillion uh, examples that he uses in that regard. I laugh. I, I don't laugh in mocking at him. I laugh because I know that people, uh, yeah, they're probably shocked at seeing this. But, you know, I think what he did was good. It's not going to knock the NIV out of its place. It's not going to knock the ESV out of its place. But it is going to maybe focus us and say, hey, is that really what literally the Greek says? <laughs> well, maybe it is. I'm not so sure it always is, but maybe it is. And it again, like we use Yahweh, you know, shock, you know, make people think. He used some of those translations, so many of which I can't even recall of them apart from senior priest right now. But I applaud his effort. It's not going to be replacing our Bibles in the pulpit that are read on Sunday morning. I don't think he has any envisioning of that. But it is going to uh, focus us on what you and I think are important. What does the original say? And if, even if he, he says it in an overly literal way, it does uh, shock us and make us think that that's what Paul and the apostles and Jesus were trying to literally say. Yeah, that's great. He actually mentioned that in our conversation that, you know, he he's not even attempting to, you know, replace right. a even just like a normal Bible reading time. Basically, it's a reference for people that don't know Greek to see, you know, what the Greek would say. I hope he watches this, Kevin, so he knows that I'm not bagging on him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to him. I, um, I may think some of his translations were a bit weird, but that's okay. I'm not bagging on him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, and, and honestly, you know, I mean, this is the kind of thing where I think it's helpful for people to see that, you know, in the scholarly world, there's differences of opinion. There's differences of, you know, translation philosophy, exegesis, and 
people don't really understand, like when they're reading, uh, uh, you know, an English text, there, there was a lot of just human scholarship that just goes into that, right? I mean, that's just what it is. Um, trying to figure out what the Greek says, trying to put that in English. There's a lot of complex issues involved. Um, and, you know, people read their Bible and they say, oh, this is the Bible, which, which is true, right? But, but it is also, you know, a product of people that are translating and that, you know, are wrestling with different meanings of the Greek, right? I mean, that's just like what it actually is. So I, I guess to that end, I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking a little bit broader here. I mean, you know, we said, okay, Scott's doing something really for a specific audience, right? Um, for people that don't know Greek to see, yeah. you know, what what the Greek might be saying. Um, do you think there is a place for different translations that employ different translation philosophies? So again, I'm, I'm thinking like a children's Bible, the Amplified Bible, or even the message or the NLT, right? Where they're doing something that is going to be different than the LS, LSB, right? But it is probably trying to target different people than than who you guys are trying to target. Is there, I mean, how do you feel about that sort of, you know, mm. enterprise? And, and and this is the, you know, obviously today it gets, you know, you basically have a, a, a Bible for every uh, possible audience, <laughs> you know, in the English speaking world. Um, so it can get a little out of hand. I think it has in a lot of ways. But but in general, how do you feel about this sort of um, enterprise? Kevin, I I would here's my conservative <laughs> coming in. Sure, I don't think we need a a, a different translation for children and a, a different translation for this group or this 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 ethnic group. I I would slow down my enthusiasm there uh, because uh, you know if if we have a children's version when they get to twelve or maybe fourteen, they're going to realize that there are other versions. So while we don't need to just insist on antiquated KJV English for them, I, yeah, I, I would be a bit hesitant uh, to do, uh, apart from what uh, uh, Scott is doing, uh, I'd be a hesitant for a niche translation for each niche in the, uh, in the Christian world. I'd be hesitant for that. Uh, you know, I, I'd say, uh, you know, if, if you'd like a, a formally equivalent translation, but you'd also like a functionally equivalent translation for, for comparison. Uh, that's okay. But I'm not sure we should have a version for every niche or every ethnic group or every age group. No, I'd, I'd slow down on that. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And that, and, and that makes sense. But, but I think even the like, you know, having that functional equivalent translation is, is doing a lot of the same things, right? I mean, they, yeah. they're trying to make the language more accessible. I think part of the, um, and that's part of what, was was behind um, Scott's, you know, work, right? Is the shock value. And yeah. when those functional equivalents started coming out, I mean, it was a shock value to a lot of people. I mean, today, I think they're much more, you know, common that it's it's not not so much the case. Well, we but, can't be too harsh on the message because the right. translator now is with the Lord. I don't want to <laughs> Eugene Peterson, but uh, people say, what? Yeah, <laughs> the message, no, I mean... Yeah massage <laughs> the massage uh, yeah it's a bit yeah yeah it's a bit different <laughs> yeah for sure so uh, let me ask you this i mean and i know again we chatted a little bit about this offline um you you so i i'm not even really sure you know what uh john macarthur is like whole involvement was in the process i i do know i, I did watch this roundtable discussion and he said um you know about the ls lsb it is not an interpretation of scripture. It is the scripture. And in the context, you know, he's talking about um, it being more on the, you know, literal side, formal equivalent rather than the the dynamic equivalents. So how, how would you respond to, you know, people working in the field of translation that you know, right, that say, you know, all translations are necessarily interpretations. At the end of the day, right, you have to pick a certain English word um, that corresponds to a greek word and you have to interpret that greek word first right i mean i think that's the the basic argument so how would you respond to you know and again yeah i know you didn't say this <laughs> um but that sort of um tension between macarthur's statement and and the translation world uh, it's a bit of a you know a, a strong statement uh our lsb is not an interpretation of scripture it is the scripture i you know uh there are theologians and lecturers and professors and then there are preachers and, and, and sometimes preachers take a little more liberty uh maybe exaggerate 
uh, maybe not throw out their knowledge, uh, uh, but but uh, uh, overstate things. Uh, we call it hyperbole. A hyperbole is not a lie. A hyperbole is exaggeration for effect. So I think that when my brother <laughs> says this is not an interpretation of scripture, it is the scripture, it's simply an overstatement. We all know, and John MacArthur knows, that there's a measure of interpretation in every translation. What I would say is that the Legacy Standard Bible is doing that as rarely as we can interpret scripture. That's where I think John meant it. We are in the area where it, it, it's not just interpreting. And if we have to interpret, we do, but it's minimal. OK, and so uh, I think that's what he meant. It was hyperbole, overstatement for effect. And I, I would agree with him, though, as a professor, I probably wouldn't say it that way. <laughs> so so that's what we're trying to do. Minimize the interpretation. But there are some times when, hey, listen, uh, you know, uh, I haven't checked it, but I yeah, yes, I have checked it in the Old Testament in the Hebrew. Sometimes there's an expression for a male. I think you know where I'm going here. As one who does his action against the wall. Okay. Yes. That's what the Hebrew says. Okay. Let's do it literally. Well, I, even the literal translations. Now, the King James was literal. <laughs> it really was. But we say every male, every male person, instead of, can I say it? One who pisseth against the wall. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, what the Bible says. That's, <laughs> that's what the Hebrew said. So, so uh, yeah, there, there is a measure of interpretation and also a measure of wisdom <laughs> that maybe uh, talk about children's Bible, reading that. Whoa. <laughs> so, so there is a measure of interpretation. But I think what John meant is in the Legacy Standard Bible, we minimize that and try to be as literally as we possibly can. Would you say then kind of the way you're defining interpretation here is more like on kind of equating it with dynamic equivalence? Because, you know, I mean, you could again, you could argue, right, that just everything is an interpretation because at the end of the day, you have to figure out what one Greek word means. And even if you're going to replace that with one English word, like it's still going from one language to the other. And so you have to interpret the Greek to get to the correct English word. But the, the way I'm hearing you kind of define interpretation or use interpretation in this context is it, it is an interpretation when I take, you know, what is word for word said in Hebrew and replace it with something that is not word for word in Hebrew or in English, but is one word that that gets, you know, a functional equivalent idea across for a certain purpose. Is that fair about what we're defining no, as? I don't need to answer that. You said it. <laughs> you said <laughs> it. that's exactly our philosophy. Uh, as literal as possible. Uh, but if it's too literal, then we try to do a functional equivalence to it. But we try to minimize that. And again, that's, I think, what John was saying. We try to minimize the interpretation and let the reader use their brain. Let the preacher teacher use their brain and explain uh, uh, that there is a broader uh, a meaning to Adel Foy here. It's not just male brothers. It's, uh, uh, you know, female uh, 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 sisters in Christ as well. But let the reader do some reading himself. And, and some interpretation himself. And then the preacher in the pulpit has a responsibility. We can't do every single interpretation for the reader or the preacher. Let's try our best to give a liberal meaning of the Hebrew and Greek and let the reader and the preacher see how they tease that to make it more understandable. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So that's, that, I think that gives us a, you know, a better idea of you know, what you mean by interpretation. I, mean, I think that's the um, kind of the sticking point with with that quote is, is he, you know, basically is saying we're sticking to word for word translation as closely as we can, right? And maybe that's the, at the end of the Over day. Perfect. <laughs> right, right. So, so I want to just close with a couple of questions about your handbook. So you, you sent this to me in the mail, this, uh, I have it right here. 
handbook for for praying scripture. And thank so, you for holding it up. <laughs> yes, yes, and thank you for for sending it to me. I I was um and you know so it, it does say on the front right that it is does feature the LSB so it's not you know completely irrelevant to this to this conversation. It, and and it is a way in which you know we are um I mean you at least want the LSB to be used. Um and I think that really is you know, why we translate to begin with, right? Like we want people to read the translation yeah. and use the translation and to be changed by the translation, right? Um, so can you tell us a little bit about this handbook um, for, for praying scripture? Yeah, a year ago last May, uh, I was praying scripture as I have been doing for, oh my, 15 years, praying scripture using various aids like Don Whitney's praying the Bible uh, and others, but most of my prayers were scripture. And then I said, well, since I'm praying scripture, I wonder if I can put together my own prayer handbook using the Legacy Standard Bible, which of course was finished by then. And so I put it together and I submitted it and they liked it at 316 Publishers and it came out in January. And uh, we're familiar with the old act prayer meeting, uh, ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving and Supplication. I've taken that, expanded it, and group together scripture texts uh, of adoration, scripture texts of thanksgiving, scripture texts of repentance, uh, scripture texts of, uh, uh, of affirmation, uh, the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, and scripture texts about personal petitions, and scripture texts about praying for others. Uh, so uh, I, I put together a month of that, and then longer prayers for a week. So it's a 31 days and then seven days. And the response has been so encouraging. Uh, it's well into its second printing. They're now talking about making a leatherette with a ribbon in it. And I, I'm so thrilled with that. But I'm thrilled not because my name is on it, because people are praying scripture. Lest we forget, the Psalms are mostly prayers. <laughs> they were intended not only to be sung and read, they were intended to be prayed. And many times, as you well know, uh, the, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that you, I pray that you, I pray that you. He's praying. Well, I, I, I've taken Psalms, put them there according to the those categories, but I've also taken some of those statements and made slight changes to them where Paul says, I pray that you will do this. I, I say, take those, that text and I say, Lord, I pray that I may do this. So it's adapting, not changing the meaning of the prayer at all, but adapting it from a second person where Paul is praying it for them to a first person, I'm praying it to the Lord. And I'm just so encouraged by the response, uh, because people say, you know, I'm focused now, you know, and, that, and that's why I started praying scripture, because I would lose my track, my train of thought, and and, and now this really has kept me focused, and uh, I, I'm just thrilled, uh, because it's uh, it's the word of God, and, uh, and, and people have written to me and say, you know, I like the shock value, uh, of, of reading Yahweh in these prayers. It makes me focus on his name more. And I say, hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Yah is an abbreviation for Yahweh, right? So uh, I, I say, thank you, Yahweh, for allowing me to do this. May it be my legacy, <laughs> not one of my commentaries on James or Philippians, but may it be my legacy that people are drawn closer to the Lord by praying his word. Yeah, that's great. I I had one more question. You know, how would you hope it is used in the life of the church? But you just you just answered it for me, and and I think that really is a great legacy to have, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, to to be able to say, hey, I directed people, you know, to mm -hmm. prayer, um, and to praying in such a way, um, really that that isn't just about me, but is primarily God centered, right? And you know, and and when you pray the scriptures. That's what it Kevin, is. I refer to gimme prayers. You know what gimme prayers are? Gimme this, gimme this, gimme this, gimme this. And listen, folks, we know that many of our prayers, if we're doing it on our own, are gimme prayers. And there is a place for petition, but it's in the larger context of adoration 
and praise and thanksgiving. Uh, and then we do our petitions within the context of worshiping God in prayer. That's what I'm trying to do in this little book. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages Podcast. Thank you, Will, for joining us. Oh, thank you, brother, for having me. It's been my delight and joy. And thank you to all of our listeners out there who have taken the time to listen to the Biblical Languages Podcast brought to you by Biblingo. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Languages Podcast brought to you by Biblingo. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. You can also follow Biblingo on social media to discuss the episode with us and other listeners. And don't forget to visit biblingo.org to start your 10-day free trial of Biblingo.